and then October 7th happened. And the anti system in those pools exploded. And so we were like, well, okay, if the connection between the army class here, not only that, but also the infusion of liberated ethnic studies. It's supposed to be just ethnic studies, but it often comes in as ethnic studies and then takes on the liberated form, which means we divide, divide people into the oppressed and the oppression. Welcome to another episode of Counterculture, the show that stands at the intersection of reason and faith in the battle against sentimentality. On the surface, Eli Steele would be the ideal poster child for America's present suicide pact with identity politics. He's black, Jewish, and deaf. Eli's great-grandfather on his father's side was born into slavery. His grandmother on his mother's side escaped the Nazis. Big intersectional score here. And look, I'm in no way making light of that family history, by the way. The Steele family is an incredible human story and a uniquely American one. It's the identity obsessed who trivialize and flatten their fellow man. Anyway, you can imagine the identitarian's collective disappointment when Eli, the son of renowned academic and author Shelby Steele, grew up to be an author and documentarian making films about the silliness and dangers of the identity politics from which he would otherwise stand to benefit greatly if he wanted to play that game. In his documentary, How Jack Became Black, Eli chronicles the laborious task of enrolling his son, Jack, into the LA public school system, where he's required to check a box for his son's race, but he doesn't want to do so. And anyway, there is no box for his son, who is black, Jewish, Latino, and Native American. What should be the rank order prioritization of those racial boxes, Eli wonders aloud in the film. But the absurdity of the identitarians in no way undermines the damage they can afflict, as Ferguson, Missouri found out, and as Eli and Shelby detailed in their film, What Killed Michael Brown. With the identitarians, it's not just about mob action on the streets, but also in the schools. Despite some high profile pushback against the diversity, equity, and inclusion bureaucracies at the collegiate and corporate levels, they mostly roll forward and nowhere do they do so with more speed than in the government school systems of America's wealthiest enclaves, like California's Menlo Atherton High School, the backdrop of Eli's latest film, Killing America, Can American Schools Be Saved? Let's watch the trailer for Killing America. I hope your family dies and burns in hell. What's your number? Show me your arm. It is a swastika. I'm not sure why. That is very upsetting. Anti-Semitic. Anti-Semitism. It's discriminating. Acknowledge the white fragility in the room and do better. Many high schools across America placed racial equity before merit. Focus, President, thinks there are too many Asians. Welcome to our Wednesday, November 15, 2023. That's what socialists of America. Ethnic studies jump the lab into the larger society so they can take their ideas about settler colonialism <laughs> and they can indoctrinate a generation of activists. It's radical figures as the heroes. I believe Israel has no right to exist. You don't learn about Martin Luther King Jr. I believe the United States has no right to exist. Black people are faster than white people. Racial equity. African-American students only 10% can pass the standardized test. Racial equity. Ethnic studies as a graduation requirement. Racial equity. We are not doing this. Not doing anything is having no board direction. Racial equity. Hey! Equity. I'm brown, but I have white values. What does it mean to be black? If we lose the opportunity that the United States provide, we have nothing. That's why Jews are hated so much. We refuse to be victims. We've forgotten to celebrate what we have in common. We are Americans. But are we? Without further ado, we welcome documentarian Eli Steele to discuss his latest film, Killing America. Eli, thank you for joining us. Appreciate it. So, thank you so much for having me. Um, so so uh, tell us the genesis of, 
uh, Killing America. I mean, I, I, I mentioned your uh, uh, previous one of your previous films, How Jack Became Black, about your son enrolling in the L.A. public school system. So that was an event that became the basis for a film. That's pretty straightforward. What, what was it about Menlo Atherton High School that you thought speaks to the larger um, race equity issue that is afflicting K through 12 education in America? The interesting thing was that it was probably late August that some parents from the uh, from my area reached out to me and they wanted they were, they were disappointed that to just literally find out that the school, the, the school district had to remove the honor classes for the last eight years. You know, two a year, three a year, and all of a sudden there was a huge gap between the general classes, the grade level classes, and the AP. And so they told me that, and I was kind of like, okay, well, we've been covering this for the last three years. I mean, you've had Virginia, you've had New York, and so forth. And so I was kind of like, but you know what, let's try to find a different angle. And so we kept talking about it. And then October 7th happened, and the anti semitism in those schools exploded. And so we were like, well, okay, is there a connection between the honor classes? Not only that, but also the infusion of liberated ethnic studies. It's supposed to be just ethnic studies, but it often comes in as ethnic studies and then takes on the liberated form, which means we divide, divide people into the oppressed and the oppression. And then something they're trying to figure out if there's something with this, this kind of trinity. Are they connected? And so that's what this film is, is an investigation into Okay, if you remove the honor classes and you put everybody in one general class, what happened to the high achieving students? And does it really help the low performing students who are coming from obviously um, a school that did not prepare them? And then you bring in, so you lower the education standards and then you bring in ethnic studies, which is sort of ideology, and it divides people to the oppressed and the oppression. Jews. Obviously, being white skin are stripped of their 5,000 years of oppression, just like the Asian people in them were called white Asians and punished for the success. So, all the things Jews are white, and then it sort of explains why anti Semitism will explode. There was a, um, an ideological morality behind it. And, and I mean, uh, for those of you who don't know, I sort of mentioned at the outset. But I mean, Atherton, California, is one of the wealthiest communities in the country. So, so um, what do the parents do? What you know, these wealthy parents that uh, have high-paying jobs or 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 generational wealth or some combination of the two, what do they do when all of a sudden they're a good sort of uh, leftist elite uh, and? they find their kid is on the wrong side of the oppressor oppressed divide at school. I mean, did this, did you see it translating into fights among families within the community too? In other words, not just balkanizing the classroom, but actually balkanizing the community. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, race is poison. I mean, you know, and so you can literally see men of Atherton a lot of the parents wanting to focus on the honor class. They did not want to focus on the ethnic study because that's race. But they don't understand that they're connected. Because if you, when you take away honor classes, which is part of the liberation ideology, meaning that if you're too successful, you're actually in oppression. So you got to remove everything and put everybody on the same, I guess, socialist level. And so these parents were sort of. They, they were just thinking that, hey, we could solve the problem by bringing the honor classes back in. No, it's all connected. And I think that's where they sort of started to rely. And it's um, it kind of been painful for them in a way because they do derive a lot of value from being good, from having their political, which tends to be more of a, uh, a liberal leftist um, identity. And so they get that pride, especially these Jewish people. So it's a shock for them to learn that they've been sort of betrayed by this movement. And so they're sort of kind of trying to find some sort of meaning, some sort of salvation, because for some reason, 
to go to the other side to become a, in the middle or go to the right is they can't do it. So, 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 this, so this is so this is a microcosm of what's happening, you know, up and down the socioeconomic uh, ladder around the country. This tension, sort of within the left, and these institutions are dominated by the left, between um, seeking status and seeking preparation and accomplishment for your kids that you know that will put them on a path. I guess if you're rich enough, you have to don't have to worry about the merit because you can paper over that with your wealth or with your connections. But I just I just wonder how you see that tension playing out. I want the status, but I want my kid to get the best education like I got and be prepared to compete and be successful on their own terms. And those two are in conflict and how that conflict gets resolved. That's the question because um, there's a um, 17 year old boy that we, uh, I'm actually a young man that we interviewed, um, Jacob. And Jacob is a trustee, a student trustee on the school board. And um, he has teased days to the film that, yes, yeah, his parent could pay that $500, that $2,000 to take um, honors chemistry, honors physics, honors English. So, in other words, they should keep the kid on track um, outside, you know, outside of the school. And sure you get, and now one thing that people need to understand is that men of African is very wealthy. And on the um, on the west side of the one-on-one, that's where the wealth is. On the east side of the one-on-one freeway, in East Palo Alto, it's a completely different demographic. Working class, largely immigrant, when I was a kid, it was mostly black. But now it's m- m- a lot of immigrants. So how do you say these two very different schools? Because the one in East Palo Alto is performing very badly, about 13% proficiency in reading, 6% in math. On the other side, it's 85% in both. And then you want to take these two very disparate outcome and put them together in the same classroom. And, and yes, the rich people can um, can sort of cover up with that. They can take care of their own kids. But the question, though, is it's a public education system. Public education, if it's done right, lifts up the entire community. It creates future employees. It creates future talent. And so these people who may be sort of escaping the bullet now, um, you know, um, you can't. You should kick the can down the road, but not for that long. Well, so this is, you know, that in the trailer that we played, um, you know, you hear your dad's voice, Shelby's voice, repeating that phrase: race, racial equity, racial equity, racial equity. And one of the takeaways, and and you know, I I I, I hate to presume people pay as close attention to this as I do or you do, because I just don't think they do. Um, but one of the, 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 the one of the takeaways is that is a mutually exclusive choice. You are either going to go with racial equity or you're going to go with merit. And there is no in between. No, um, it, it's polar opposite for you. Um, you know, like as you mentioned in the opening, I come from multiple races, and I think my father had said one time that he is also has a white mother and a black father, and that sort of demystifies race for you. And so that's why we really understand that race is about power, but it is about power over other people, about power of one tribe over another tribe. Merit is the ultimate power. Merit is America because merit is the power of the individual. And we strongly, I would never back down from this, is that the stronger you develop the individual, the more of an act that that individual is to the community, to the country. When you have racial equity and when you lower these standards, you create weak people. And I mean, there's no other way to look at it. And that is the travesty of what's happening in Menlo Atherton because I did ask when we had we showed the film last Saturday and I made the point that okay, this district spent the last eight years removing honor classes 
in the name of racial equity. What did they do in the last eight years to lift up um, the schools in East Palo Alto? Nothing. East Palo Alto gets more money per student. If you should see, if you look closely at the wrong footage of the schools, they're remodeling it. They're, it's a brand new campus. It's beautiful. Money has nothing to do with it. I mean, my, my grandfather had third grade education and lived in segregation for 90% of his life. But he learned how to read every book. So, so that don't identify the line about poverty. I mean, we have public libraries, we have resources everywhere. So uh, you mentioned the screening last week. So I'm interested to hear, I mean, this is, it's, 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 this is a screening where, you know, the backdrop of the film, the, the high school, so this is right there. I'm interested to hear like what the differing reactions were to the film from sort of the, the stakeholders in the school, like the administrators and the teachers, versus maybe some of the parents and the students who are also stakeholders, but but not in, you know, don't have the same authority. I wonder, you know, those that are very protective and probably defensive about what they're doing versus maybe parents and students who are a little bit in the dark about what's happening or don't have the full story and feel like maybe they got more of the story by watching your film. Yes, and uh, I think that's one thing that I always do because I'm obviously making films in very controversial areas. So I try to take sort of a dispassionate approach. It's got to be entertaining. I mean, entertainment, but it has to be dispassionate. And so we spend a lot of time just literally showing you the PowerPoint that the teacher used to sort of to paint Israel in the false light. She's the ethnic studies teacher. So we show that. We show the numbers, we show all of that. And it's very difficult to disagree with that because that is what the school produced. Our crime is they were showing it. And so I think a lot of the people that attended the film really, really enjoyed the film, really um, thought it was powerful. The biggest complaint was that it was too short. <laughs> but which is a good thing, which is a good thing. Um, yeah, uh, I mean, look, it was, it, it was expected to be only like 10 minutes short. That's all we were supposed to do. And so 38 minutes was a lot longer than we planned for that. Um, but the thing was that we really just wanted to show, okay, here's your school board meeting. The boring. But my intent was to go into the details and really pull the details down to show you how it actually works. And I think that's what people really appreciated because they appreciate the fact that it was manipulated, that it was just very factual. Um, and then, of course, you get the people that um, have not seen the film. And so we got a very um, interesting email from the principal of uh, Mendo Atherton High who slammed the film as propaganda and completely ridiculous. But here's the catch. He based that on the trailer. He <laughs> and the school board and various other people were invited. He said, hey, come on, we have nothing to hide. Come watch the film. They didn't do that. So instead, they do the same performative, very traditionally, hey, you know what? These people are evil. These people are, uh, for what? Okay, so you, but here, that's what pissed me off because you have a teacher that literally lied. Uh, and for a Stanford graduate, a Stanford graduate, Stanford should be taking the diploma back. Because, I mean, come on, you can't produce that kind of incompetence. But we are ridiculous, and she's not. The, the, the teacher lied. What was the lie that the teacher told that you memorialized in the film? It was very interesting. I mean, she then, um, she quoted, quoted, the United Nations as saying that the creation of Israel was illegal, which never happened. And she also said to describe uh, Hamas as uh, people from Gaza. I'm kind of, I don't have a direct quote, but that's pretty close, as people from Gaza instead of, you know, terrorists. And she also said that Hamas attacked uh, IDF soldiers. No, the primary target were the, were the civilians. And I mean, on and on. And so what she really did was she introduced the whole framework as uh, the dominant narrative, which is the oppression narrative and the uh, 
Armed oh, resistance. You wish you defeat yeah, the narrative. That... It's just you into that. And once you do that, you, you lose our complexity sheet. Because it is a complex subject. You have history. You have, uh, I mean, I think that's the beauty of video games with the complexity of it. Um, that we really, really learned about humanity, that we really learned about difficult choices. When you put a false brain rock onto it, you oversimplify everything and then you make everything about color. And truth goes rare because the truth will always be on the side of the oppressed. So, so um, the parents who came to see the film, what did they say when they saw this uh, display, like the, uh, the, the instructional uh, uh, information she was using and the things she was saying that you were describing? Or were they like, I can't believe this is going on in the high school and we're going to do something about it? Or what was the reaction? Yeah, well, they knew about the um, about the um, about the uh, presentation law and before our video. It, this article is written about it. Let me let me just maybe go into a micro costume and just kind of maybe focus on this Jewish community part of it. But to the credit of the larger community, there was Jewish parents and non-Jewish parents that objected to the presentation. So I was happy to see that. The principal, however, seems to have led this investigation to kind of went nowhere. <laughs> yeah, and so um, and that's what was really frustrating to the parents. They just go like, yeah, 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 yeah. And then nothing happened. The teacher apparently went on leave because of harassment from the parent, but she's still teaching. So which one is it? You're playing the fish, but you're still teaching. I don't know which one is it. And then what was the other thing? Um, yeah, so they... So the parent, and so now I think the Jewish community is divided over whether they want DEI out. They want to, I mean, because DEI, the problem with DEI is that not every group is treated equally. And so they want DEI out so everybody should be treated equally. The other side either want DEI or DEI life. They think that they can watch some of these Jews want to jump into the oppressed box. <laughs> Which is not going to happen because I mean that would that would just break everything apart, and uh, they don't understand that. They don't really understand the knee barriers, the knee barriers forces behind all of this. They don't understand the history that this be going on just in nice this and they really don't understand the Hamas when they attacked uh, Southern Israel on October seven. We're counting on that. They were counting on liberation ideology. We're now in Ferguson. I kept, I kept shocked by the Palestinian, uh, the Palestinian uh, person. What do, they, what do they have to do with that? Well, now you see, it's all related. Solidarity and marginality, uh, real or perceived, yeah. mostly, mostly perceived. And it's right, it's the, it's the um, sort of grotesque dynamic where people who you know live in the wealthiest one of the wealthiest communities in the country are i want to be in the oppressed category too and then uh, other marginalized can be saying no you're not a, you don't look like me so you can't be oppressed and and arguing about who gets to be oppressed uh because of course nobody wants to be characterized as an oppressor i mean this is the state of k-12 through education uh in so many respects that's an oversimplification but i mean uh, you know boil down this example sort of speaks to it so so when you say that, you know, killing America, can America's schools be saved? This is what you're talking about, right? Because this is, this dynamic, some iteration of it is happening virtually everywhere. Yes, yeah, I, I mean, you know, you know, you know my work, you know me, I know you too. And when I interviewed the teacher that was undercover, um, we had a blur who faced out, um, changed his voice. I was so depressed because he basically was just saying that we should be removing merit. Um, one example that he gave was something that sounds very normal. It called standards based grading. So I, was, I looked at that and I think, yeah, that's standard, right? 90 to 100 percent is the A, 80 percent to uh, 100, um, 90 is the B. That's, right? That's your standard. No, it's like the democratic the Democratic Socialist Republic of North Korea is a lie. It really, right, it, it's actually a new, uh, a new standard which is sort of be suggested and sort of heavily 
push upon the teacher. So under that under that rubric, eighty percent to one hundred percent is A. Sixty percent to eighty percent is B. Forty so there's no more failure. No more failure, nothing. And then you remove the SDCs, you remove the ACT. What well, how you judge people? Well then one kid one kid told me, well you know before the affirmative Sebastian, uh, the Supreme Court thing on the affirmative Sebastian, Asians would get punished, right? They would get point taken away from them. Well, today under the new under the new standard, if you're black and you don't submit a standardized test to the college, nothing. You're fine, nothing. If you're Asian and you don't submit, you get punished. They should flip the model. It's still going on. And so my point is so all of this Killed America. We just lower the standards to meaninglessness, and then you have parents sort of not wanting to get involved. Well, then who has all the power? Who has all the momentum? So, what's the thread, uh, if there is one? I think there is, but I want you to describe it if, if my intuition is right. What's the thread between uh, your dad's work, white guilt, most notably? Um, how Jack Became Black, your film about your son, the film you and your dad did together, uh, What Killed Michael Brown, and Killing America. Is, what, what, what's, the, what's the thread that, uh, that binds all of this work together? Uh, your work as well as sort of the generational work of your family? Yeah, um, uh, great question. I think I'm just right you know, I mean, it's so simple, a lot of people they think it's Marxism, they think it's socialism, which is true. I mean, those are the forces. But what is the grief? What is the force that makes that possible? Because if you look in um, the Brotherhood, in the 1940s, the, you know, the communists, they used the racial injustices, right? They used the injustice of racial supremacy to try to win over black. Well, they're, do, they're doing the same thing again. And this is, if you want to be on the right side of history, if you don't want to be a racist, if you don't want to be a racist supremacist, if you don't want to be part of, if you want to, don't want to be part of systemic racism, you must join up. You must, you must dismantle this whole system. Literally, I mean, it's, that's what they're doing. I mean, when you when you change the greatest system, you are dismantling the system. And so, white guilt is the thread. White guilt is everything, and white guilt is literally what is killing America. Because um, if we are um, unfairly or not, we Americans today have had the challenge of trying to deal with the history of oppression, four centuries of oppression. We are literally, I mean, we're only 70 years out of that. And so that's what's going on here. We're trying to deal with that. We're trying to figure out a way around that. And unfortunately, people have to shatter to see power by using right girl to engineer the new vision of America, which is not our version of America. And yeah, so right girl is just everything. I mean, it really is. Because when you have somebody, when a parent, I'll oh, yeah, give you another point. Everybody in the, in the short film is an immigrant or a standard an immigrant or a minority. None of them were the, um, all the Americans, the Americans to be here for six generations and stuff like that. Those American needs to step up. Well, right. I mean, the, the, the reference you made to one of the subjects you interviewed, the teacher who was describing to you how they've uh, methodically removed merit from the system, from the grading system. But you have to uh, shroud his face and you have to alter his voice like he's uh, the star witness in a mob trial and he's going to be put in the witness protection program rather than a teacher who disagrees with removing um, the merit-based system in terms of how you grade the work that students do and, and how, you, you know, uh, how you run the school essentially and how you conceive of education, of uh, you know, behavior and work product base. But I mean, you know, that, that, that whole thing, and, and I, I don't know about you, but I'm just so tired of hearing people who know what is wrong at, that are, I guess they're willing to do more than most, but I'm still sick of hearing it. I, 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 would, I would do this, but I'm afraid. 
I, I would tell you straight away, I, I wouldn't disguise my identity, but there are these repercussions and, and those repercussions as if like you being afraid to speak the truth um, and defend your professional integrity at the same time, not to mention the interests of the kids and your charge and the families you're supposed to serve. Like, like being afraid is some legitimate cover story for being a coward, for being silent. I think that's something that we have to really attack too. And say, uh, and say stop saying like, I understand that. No, actually, I don't understand that. I don't accept that as an excuse. Oh no, I, I'm, I'm tired too, I'm tired because you know, my family's been in fight too long. I just wanna go fishy. <laughs> like I don't worry, yeah, yeah, right. I wanna deal with it. Yeah, and um, but I, I wanna give one, I, I need to give a big shout out to Diana, Diana Blum, who is the star of this, of this film. And Diana is done stuff, you know, as she's a very uh, a liberal woman. Um, she's a very, she's a doctor, she's an amazing story. She's, born um, in the Soviet Union, came here as a, uh, as a young child, to escape anti-Semitic system in the Soviet Union. That's why she's shocked to have it follow her to Menlo Atherton High. And this is a woman that was born in poverty, lived in poverty in San Francisco, and lifted herself up. She got into a merit-based high school, Laurel High School, lifted herself up and became a doctor. I mean, come on, that's the American dream. And but she was a liberal, and so she had a deal with that. And it was the it was the injustice. It was how other people behave. And she saw that, and she really said, "You know what? I'm sick and tired of this. I'm I'm done. I'm gonna do what's right, and I'm gonna pay the price." And guess what? She has two young daughters, beautiful, intelligent daughters, and and, and she has a husband that also has a job too. So they're all pretty everything on the lines with this film. And that's what we need more of. These are the people that will preserve America so you should see the contrast between that family and other families. My family went through this that same thing, same thing in 1990 in this that same neighborhood just about 30 miles down the road. So for me to come back and show my film in that area, which would have never happened about five years ago, it's a positive direction. I think it's a positive step forward. And, um, you know, she keep pushing. Yeah. Well, I mean, um, you know, cowardice is contagious, but so is courage. Um, and so, you know, you, you know, provide an example that other people can emulate and and try to yeah. ignore the ones that you shouldn't emulate. But anyway, um, so, so yeah, so I was, that's where I was getting to. It's interesting you say that you see positive movement and this film is, is, um, testimony to that. So from uh, how Jack became black several years back to this film, when it comes to people standing up, when it comes to people saying, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going to participate in the race hustle. I'm going to push back in my own way where I can. Do you see, do you see th that on the rise? I know we see these you know, sort of one-offs. University of Florida gets rid of their dye programs and some corporations are walking back some of their dye bureaucracies, but they all seem very one-off. It doesn't, it doesn't give an indication of which direction really this is going. And so I wonder, since you um, have traveled the country doing these films and talking to so many people, you know, do you get a sense of where this battle is and, and uh, where the, the, the lines are drawn today as where they were maybe 10 years ago? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I'm an American. So I think being American is you always have to be um, optimistic. Even if the country is going down, you have fight for it to the end and with a smile and on your face. I mean, it's such a great country. I mean, my family would not eat this without the country, period. And I think the huge positive is that everybody in this film is the liberal. And that would never happen. Um, and so these people are waking up slowly. And But when they wake up, they wake up. And they, they can't go backwards. And so that's a huge positive for us. And I think that's why we just have to keep pushing, keep pushing on principle, keep pushing on principle. And what should happen is the other side has no real argument. They should say the same thing over and over. And we kind of know it now that the charge of racism it gets weaker and weaker, which is great because in order for America to rise again, white guilt, 
and the power that can be made off of it has to go down. And, and so that's what we need to do. The reason that he calls you a racist or something like that. So you have to go, nah, just screw, screw you. And the main thing here, though, is and some white people make the mistake of doing that. They fall back into the white identity. They, they, they thought you'd say, well, I'm a victim as a white person. No, you've, you've lost the battle the minute you pick up the race. So you have to, the way I say is you have to fight as an American. Now, because that is America is principle. America is not race. There is no color to America. America, the American identity, the American principle, are so far more inclusive, so, so far more diverse than any form of racial engineering. I mean, that's just the fact. But the problem with it is there's one problem with the American principle. It's not fair. It's hard. It's brutal. It's, yeah, I mean, if you fail, look at my own life. I fail over and over and over. I'm on a maybe a 10 year one now. But people that, oh man, I was on the bottom. But it was following the American principle. People had these faith in me. And me having faith in myself, and and thanks to great parents who um, developed me into a strong individual, I have power today, and I also have power because I never ever checked the race box. So that gives me my authority. No, that's a great point, and it's one that a lot of conservatives, frankly, need to internalize because. This whole, you know, rail against identity politics, and then you you turn around and you see some Republican politician saying, as a woman or as a black man or as you know this and as that. Well, you're 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 advancing their flag when you play that game. That's exactly right. That's such an important point because you see Republicans and erstwhile conservatives guilty of the same thing. Um, I wanted to just uh, talk about your films again because it's been interesting. You've had some controversies uh, with your films over the years. Uh, how uh, excuse me, what killed Michael Brown? You, it was available on Amazon, then it, then it wasn't available on Amazon, then it was again. So I just um, maybe recount that story in terms of, you know, how, uh, what it takes, including maybe for budding filmmakers, to get controversial topics to market in the era of, you know, uh, concentrated digital streaming services. Oh, yeah. I mean, we, um, we knew it, we knew that we were touching the third rail in a way uh, by going into Ferguson and telling the other story. It's about five or six other documentaries that tell the other story, which is the hand of the shoe narrative. And um, but the thing is, I felt that we would be safe by going to Amazon because Amazon positions itself as a platform. In other words, it's not a publisher. A publisher has the right to say no and yes you did but a platform means as long as you meet the um, conditions you allow one to the platform with the conditions are like you, you can't have excessive violence excessive nudity uh, language and stuff like that obviously um, that film didn't have it so when Amazon when I got a letter from Amazon after Jason Riley published that Wall Street Journal up there which was sort of calling into question Amazon might ban the film because we still had not received notice that the film was going to be posted and the film was supposed to come out that Friday. It was a shock in a way because it showed you the power of the, um, of the company because it's not a public company. Amazon is a private company and the power of the company should just all of a sudden um, squash you like a little ant. And like you're meaning that, and then, they, and then on, 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 that, on that email, it said, you cannot appeal that. So I'm like, okay, I'm going to take you for your word, but I'm going to go to the media. <laughs> um, I mean, you have a power that we, we have to get the attention. And but thank, thankfully, because of my father's work and my father's, um, you know, writing for the Wall Street Journal and Fox and all of that, a lot of other media, we were able to get that attention and push back on Amazon. And it was also the same reason that the Hunter Biden um, computer thing happened. And Amazon didn't, I guess they just felt like it was too much. And so they threw the film up. But I think the biggest lesson, the big, and with the film, it did well. I mean, it reached the number one spot. It was in the top 10 for about a month and a half. 
Um, but the biggest lesson here, and for any filmmaker, it's scary. It's scary because I would tell them, you know what? If it's your passion, you have no choice but you make it, which is a great thing. And you know, but you make it, you make it the best way you can. I mean, you can't foresee what's going to happen. But what the danger here, though, is you spend all two. I spent two years, about three years of my life on it. I did nothing else. Three, three years of my life on it. And as you can see, racist. Well, then why would any other filmmaker do that? Make that? And I was getting paid, like, well, not much. I mean, not much at all. So, but the, and that's just you pay my bills and stuff like that, because we were putting all the money into the um, into the film. And so that's what, and that's the biggest danger, and that's where Amazon really violated the, um, the trust of the public and the trust of the artists, because, okay, if you want to make a liberal movie, if you want to make a movie that stays... Look, by the way, I don't really consider my movie should be conservative or liberal. It's factual. We, are, we my father, takes a very existential view of life. This is what is happening. There is white guilt. There's massive guilt after all centuries of oppression. That's just a fact. And these people came into Ferguson and they exploited that guilt for power. All we did was point that out. Right, no, and, I mean, they're, they're, yeah. yeah. Yeah, they're explanatory. And I mean, if you have a different theory about what happened in Ferguson or what's happening in K through 12 education, then advance your theory. And, you know, uh, whoever gets persuaded in whichever direction, I mean, that's how you're supposed to flesh things out in a free society, not, you know, run around trying to silence people you disagree with. I mean, it seems pretty basic, but this is a concept that a lot of people in 2024 America don't seem to be able to grasp. Um, so, all right, so the films, uh, for, again, uh, Eli Steele's oeuvre, uh, How Jack Became Black, uh, What Killed Michael Brown, and now Killing America, uh, Can America's Schools Be Saved? And, um, uh, I know you're doing screenings for Killing America, and people can get information on the screenings at manofsteelproductions.com, right? Manofsteelproductions.com, and then and then yeah. we'll also find out what how uh, the film how Killing America is going to be distributed at some point during the process of getting a distributor, right? Yeah, I would add the um, you go to Man of Steel on the step back. And I do a newsletter about once a week, have all the updates. And one other point, though, is the Killing America is actually part of the feature and documentary that I'm doing with my father, White Kill. And I use this film, um, Killing America, as, I mean, Kill, Killing America as a way to sort of understand the aftermath of um, October 7th, how the war was changing, and how we had the very first almost active liberation firing. So now we've crossed that Rubicon and we've actually seen it happen. We've seen the college campuses justify that. Well, what made that possible? White guilt, because white guilt just squeezed the road all the way down to that. And the Palestinians understood that. They understood that that was their power. It's just a lot of blacks, uh, like Al Sharpton understand that in America. Iran understands that. That's why they say America is a racist country. When they're, you know, uh, blowing gay people off the roof, when they're, uh, you know, putting women in jail, but just trying to uh, show their hair. I mean, this is shoddy, completely flipped. Anyway, anyway everything on the, um, would be on the Man of Steel uh, stuff. That. That's probably the best way to follow this. Man of Steel Subsack, Man of Steel Productions dot com. And also, too, I'm just glad, by the way, as a quick aside before I let you go, I'm just glad that uh, you guys were able to finish uh, Killing America and you're still working on you're going to finish that White Gill feature film. Because I know in San Francisco, you got all your camera equipment stolen. You got your car broken into and your camera equipment stolen. So that's becoming a familiar story in big city America, too. And you experienced it firsthand. Oh, yeah. I mean, that was a horrible day. That was a horrible day. You really saw the bottom. You really saw no police. Nobody care. I mean, I grew up in the Bay Area. I mean, I, I went to San Francisco. My parents would leave me in the park with my sister and go to the shop. It was such a, I mean, it was such a great city. I mean, it was. Great people. And somewhere along the line, it's just been wrong. Yeah. Mm. Eli Steele, thanks so much for joining us on Counterculture. Best of luck with the latest offering, Killing America. Appreciate your time, and uh, we'll continue to follow your work. Let's keep that 10-year run going. 
Thank you so much, Dan. I really appreciate it. You've always been a great supporter, so I appreciate that. Please like this video and subscribe to this channel if you haven't already. And please leave a comment in the comment section. We'd love to hear your thoughts.